Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Can we turn to the book of Obadiah uh, once more, please? And just looking at the, the end of this little prophecy. We'll read from verse 17 to the end of the, the, uh, the, the book or the chapter, whichever you want to say. So Obadiah and the verse 17. Again, let us hear God's word. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions, and the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble. And they shall kindle in them and devour them, and there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord hath spoken it. And they of the south shall possess the mount of Esau, and they of the plain the Philistines. And they shall possess the fields of Ephraim and the fields of Samaria, and Benjamin shall possess Gilead. And the captivity of this host of the children of Israel shall possess that of the Canaanites, even unto Zarephath. And the captivity of Jerusalem, which is in Sepharad, shall possess the cities of the south. And saviors shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau. And the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Amen. And we know that the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his infallible word. The scene that is described in the closing part of Obadiah's prophecy again relates to the restoration of God's people back to Jerusalem, to Judah, uh, to see the antagonism and the hatred of the people of Edom, the descendants of Esau, turned around. And all that would go with that expression of uh, the, the glee of their enemies as they witnessed God's people taken into captivity, that's going to be turned on its head. And God's people are going to have the experience of uh, delighting in God vindicating his own cause. Uh, it's a hard thing to see people triumph over you. It's hard to be in that position where you are led captive or you are defeated. Uh, it's harder still when you know that your cause is right, that your God is true. And it's, it's easy to feel tempted that it, it's really not worth continuing or pursuing. It's easier just to give up and forget about it all. Uh, and you feel totally... Uh, bereft of, of comfort perhaps, but God comforts his people in the knowledge of what the future will, will bring. And we've had that again tonight in our reading in first, sorry, in Second Thessalonians, where uh, we read of the hope that the day is coming when the Lord will vindicate his own cause. It's not that we will be proven to be right, but if we are on the Lord's side, it will be proven in that day that we have been on the right side. And it's, it's not just about being able to say, I'm on the right side and you're not, but our, our interest and our care is for Christ and his glory. That we will be able to see, say to others, as it were, you see, God was right all along. Jesus Christ is true. You were, you were wrong to suggest otherwise. You were wrong to come to this conclusion that it didn't matter, that it didn't matter whether you really believed or not, that that's a dangerous and a wrong position to hold. And one day it will be shown to be so because those who have thought that way and lived that way, that's that faulty foundation that's going to be destroyed and they are going to be destroyed and they will find themselves in hell, separated from God, separated from God's mercy, that is, and God's love and God's grace forever and exposed to the wrath of God forever. And so a day of vindication is coming. And, and that's described here, the, uh, the fact that on Mount Zion there will be deliverance. There's, a, there's escape there, and, and those who escape will be there. There will be holiness. The house of God will be set up again. God will be worshipped in that right way. 
there's going to be a destruction of Esau. They're going to be the stubble, the house of Israel and Joseph and Jacob and uh, Judah are going to be the fire. Esau is going to be destroyed and there's going to be a repossessor. And so these uh, different ways of talking about both Judah and Israel, north, south, east and west within that people group, they're going to possess the, the lands around them. They're going to take possession of a kingdom, if you remember, that is going to be much larger than was true of any of the kings before the exile. And indeed, would be larger than any dominion that Israel has ever known in her history. And it's a way of pointing to the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, a kingdom that uh, will extend beyond, well beyond the borders of Israel in that Levant region and through the Middle East, uh, much further than Mesopotamia, but it will be the kingdom that will cover the whole world. The kingdom of Christ, the gospel kingdom that we live in today. And it's in light of that that we read this last verse of Obadiah, that saviors shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. The kingdom shall be the Lord's. Well, it's the first part of that verse that I really want us to uh, think about this evening in the time that we have and with God's help. Saviors shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau. Now, there are perhaps a number of questions there immediately that spring to mind. First of all, saviors. Should it not be saviour? Is it a something of a mistake? Uh, should we just cancel the S off the end and make it singular and say it's saviour, singular? Well, it is saviours, and we'll come to look at that. Another question that might arise is, how can there be judgment on the Mount of Esau if Esau has been destroyed? If Esau has been burned up like stubble, then there's nothing to judge, or so it would seem. And so those are, are things that we want to, to look at this evening. But b before we look in any detail, just keep in mind then that what we are looking at here, as I've already said, is something bigger than just a, a period in history that occurred when the children of Israel and Judah were restored back to their land. In the, and I'll probably get it wrong, in the 5th century uh, BC. Uh, this is something that is pointing beyond that. And many of the prophecies that we read, whilst they do have an historical fulfillment, that is, there was a fulfillment that took place in history, they were looking forward beyond that to a much larger fulfillment because Christ and his kingdom is in view. And really this, uh, without doubt, points to that. Well, first of all, the question at the start of the verse, who are the saviors? Who are the saviors? Well, we remember that the fact that Israel came back out of captivity at all was purely the work of God. Uh, there were no interest groups in Babylon or in the land of the Chaldeans. There were no pressure lobby groups that were agitating down there for a return to the land. Uh, it was God who worked. It was God who stirred the heart of the king. In keeping with God's word, we're told in the scriptures that the, the heart of the king, the heart of the ruler, is in the Lord's hand. And the heart there, of course, means his, his thoughts. Not just his heart in terms of his feelings or his affections, but his whole inner life. His thoughts, his desires, all of those things are in the Lord's hand. And the Lord can turn them whatever way he wants. The Lord can turn the way that rulers think. The Lord can turn the way that rulers feel and what they desire. They can be given different desires. They can be given thoughts that they have not really thought themselves. They've been given by God. And so God gave thoughts to these kings that they would send 
the children of Israel, the children of Judah, back to their land. In that sense, salvation in their restoration was purely the Lord's doing. That was all of God. That was all of his grace. That was all of his covenant faithfulness. That was all based on God's integrity, uh, his commitment to keep his own word. God promised it, and God made good in the promise. And that's to be expected. that God always keeps his word. We can trust him to do that this evening. We can rely upon him. But we're told here that saviors shall come up on Mount Zion. These saviors coming up uh, demonstrate in, in some way uh, that the Lord Jesus Christ is a, a saviour in a different way or capacity, in a superior way to anything that anyone else could ever do. Uh, because these saviours, whoever they are, we, we see very closely on in verse 21 that the kingdom is not ascribed to them. It's not their kingdom. It says that the kingdom shall be the Lord's. So whoever they are, again, before we try to identify them more clearly, we, we understand that uh, the kingdom doesn't belong to them, that they haven't secured it for themselves or for others. They haven't secured it for, the, for others so that they themselves become the leaders and, and, and it's their kingdom. It's the kingdom of the Lord's. It, it is his. And Christ is a savior in a way that nobody else can be. So the point here is this. That the Lord, when he saves, uh, he often, more often than not, he, what we might say, mediates that salvation. That is, he brings his salvation through some instrumentality. God uses a mediator. He uses means. And that's really what is uh, at the heart of this expression, saviors shall come up on Mount Zion. Who are they? What did they do? Well, if we want to understand a bit more about who they are and what they did, turn back uh, to the book of Nehemiah. And if you turn to Nehemiah, you'll find this uh, expression used uh, by Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 9 and the verse 27 uh, is the, the text in particular that you want to, uh, to see. Uh, just to back up a little ways from that text and uh, to, go, to go back, speaking about the children of Israel when they came into the land of Israel many years before, um, they were told here in this chapter that that when God brought them into the land of Canaan, they took possession of, of the land and of all the good that was in the land, and they were abundantly blessed. Uh, and yet we read this in verse 26, Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against thee and cast thy law behind their backs and slew thy prophets which testified against them to turn them to thee, and they wrought great provocation. So that, that's talking about the period uh, after the days of Joshua and going into the days of the judges. But it's also, you can see here from the language, it's exactly the same scenario as played itself out in the days before the exile into Babylon. Same sort of thing. God had blessed them, but they cast God's law behind their backs. And that's, that's just a way of saying they, they didn't care for God's commandments. They didn't keep them. So if you're, if you're casting God's law behind your back, whatever way you're looking and whatever you're looking at, it's not God's law because that's behind you. So if God's way is behind you, you're going in the wrong direction. You're, you're going in the opposite direction. And that's the question tonight. Are you going, are you walking in the way of God's commands? God has given us commands. He's given us laws. He's given us statutes. He's given them to us so that we would live in them, that we would obey them, that we would follow them. 
They're not given to us just to speculate about or to acknowledge that they are part of religion. They are a living thing. We're to live in those ways. And the danger is that we can take God's commandments and just throw them behind our back and go off in a different direction and live according to our own thinking. Now, the, the danger of that is it's not safe. Now, it's, dis, it's, it's not safe because, yes, we disobey God, we incur His wrath and His displeasure. But it's also not safe in that only God's ways are safe. Right? Only the ways that God sets out before us are actually good for us. Every other way is harmful. It's harmful to us in our, in our whole being. God gives us laws that are good for us, uh, good for our soul, good for our mind, good for our health physically. So our, our, our well-being spiritually, mentally, and physically there, is bound up in following God's law. If we don't follow His law, it's not good for us. So it's dangerous because it's, it's not a good way that we go. It's dangerous because we incite God to anger. And, and it's dangerous and therefore we're told in verse 27 of Nehemiah 9, Therefore thou deliverest them into the hand of their enemies who vexed them. And in the time of their trouble, when they cried unto thee, thou heardest them from heaven, and according to thy manifold mercies, thou gavest them saviors who saved them out of the hand of their enemies. So saviors used here, again, same idea that we have in Obadiah verse 21. And what has been spoken of here in Nehemiah, of course, is the period of the judges. What happened? Their enemies, the Midianites, the Canaanites, would become strong. And they would go into the land of Israel. They would destroy their crops, their harvests. Uh, they would render the, the people uh, uh, penniless, uh, substance-less, weak. And in these times of oppression at the hand of the enemy... God's people would cry unto God. And when they cried to God, isn't that wonderful the language? That God heard them from heaven and according to God's manifold mercies. According to his manifold mercies. Because here are people who have been rebellious. They haven't put a foot right. They've put every footstep wrong. What have they done? They'd cast God's law behind their back. The prophets that God sent, they slew them. They didn't listen. And yet when they cried to God in their moment of need, God didn't remind them of all the wrong that they'd done. God just didn't say, well, you're, you're only reaping what you're sowing. That was true. But according to his manifold mercies, God gave them saviors. He raised up judges, men like perhaps the most famous of them all, Samson. Othniel, others that God raised up uh, to deliver his people, Shamgar, and so forth. Men that were instrumental in the hand of God to enact deliverance from their enemy, oftentimes with military uh, uh, accomplishments. They would attack the enemy. They would stand against them. They would oppose them. And they would restore a sense of right order within the land. The people would turn back to God in their hearts. They would begin to worship God again. They would put God in his rightful place in their lives. And there would be an ensuing period of peace, a period of prosperity, a period where they were free from the oppression of the enemy because they sought the Lord and there was someone there who would bring God and God's word and God's direction into their situation. And they were called saviors. Now you fast forward to the period uh, uh, after the exile, after the people return from Babylon, what happens? Well, they're saved. They're brought out of exile. They're back in the land, but God sends them saviors. Who are they? What are they? Well, they are men like Ezra, men like Nehemiah, prophets like Haggai and Zechariah, men that God sent to his people to save them. To save them how? Well, to save them by turning them away from their sin. Because even though they came back from captivity, the result of their rebellion or the rebellion of their fathers, they themselves sinned again. They came back to Zion 
But they came back and they started to sin all over again. What did they do? Well, remember, they were supposed to build the temple and they, they left off building. And instead of spending the resources on the building of God's house as they were expected to, they spent those resources on building their own homes and their own houses instead of God's house. God's house is in ruins. Their houses are the last word. They uh, marry outside of the covenant family. So instead of marrying those within the, the nation of Judah and Israel, they, they marry those outside, the unbelievers from the nations round about. That has to be addressed. They, they are guilty of not keeping the Sabbath day. They're, they're buying and selling. They're, they have affinity and relationships with those uh, ungodly people around about them. They, the worship of God isn't being kept pure. There are people in there serving as Levites, as priests, who can't uh, show or prove their descent from Aaron. They have no right to be there. The worship of God has been defiled. All of these things are happening. And men like Ezra and Nehemiah, Haggai and Zechariah, they come in with a message from God and a mandate from God to put away sin, to address these situations and to call the people back to God. And so there's, there's a sense of, uh, of purity that is reestablished in a proper order of worship. Allah what happened in the period of the judges. So if we're trying to understand who, who are the judges that are mentioned here, or, or rather the saviors that are mentioned here, what, what, what are they about? What, what's this look like? Well, we're thinking about a period in time now under Christ and his kingdom when saviors shall come up on Mount Zion. What's this about? Well, here are people that are sent by God to call his people back from the paths of sin. People who have been saved. People who have been redeemed. People who have been bought by God. But they need someone to come and call them back into the paths of righteousness and holiness. And they are the saviors. They are the saviors that the Lord raises up. What do they do? Well, again, we've got a, an illustration of this uh, in the book of Genesis in the life of Moses. Uh, in Genesis, I can get the, uh, the right uh, place. Um, Uh, not, not, did I say Genesis? The book of Exodus, rather. Uh, anyway, I'll, uh, I'll struggle to find it for whatever reason right now. But the, the story, the piece of history, you remember how Moses had left Egypt and uh, he comes down into the land of Midian and uh, he ultimately comes, so it's uh, Exodus chapter 2, um, he comes to the, uh, and, and happens upon the family of Ruel. Um, he happens upon his daughters who are watering their father's flock. And uh, you uh, remember how that on that occasion there, there are other shepherds there uh, who are decidedly unkind to Ruel's daughters. And uh, they won't allow them access to the well. And, and we're told in, in Exodus 2, 17, And the shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. And the word helped them uh, is the same word that we've got here as Saviour's Nobadiah 21. So it's the idea of, of helping, of saving, of intervening. And it's very telling here that what Moses did is really a picture of what the saviors do. What do they do? They give people access to the water. The enemy was keeping them back from the water. What is the water? Well, the water would remind us, certainly, of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who is the living water. And here we can't help but notice that the enemy of our soul does what? The enemy of our soul would keep us back from the water of life. There is a fountain that contains the water of life. And that, that fountain is found in Jesus Christ. He is the reservoir of the water of life. And he offers it freely. But the enemy of our soul will keep us back. 
our flesh would keep us back. The world would call us away from this fountain and say, drink somewhere else. Uh, as you know, I was on jury service uh, for uh, a while there. And if nothing else, the case that eventually got, uh, we got dismissed as a jury because of a, a technical problem in the case. But the one thing that the case really screamed loud and clear to me was the danger of drunkenness. And it just reminded me how much sin comes about as a result of drunkenness. How many problems there are in terms of legal cases, things the, the police have to deal with, things that the emergency uh, departments in the hospital have to deal with, how many relationships, how many friendships die as a result of drunkenness. The strange thing for me was that listening to other people talking about it afterwards or just talking in general about drink and drunkenness, it was just how matter-of-fact and glib they were about it. As if it were a good thing, or certainly that it wasn't a bad thing. And it strikes me that our own flesh, the world, the devil, encourages people to keep drinking at another fountain that will never satisfy them. And not only will it not satisfy them, but it will destroy them. It will ruin them. And as we sang today already, that I, I tried the broken cisterns, Lord, but ah, the waters failed. Even as I stooped to drink, they mocked me. Uh, and I've lost the, 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 the thread there. And they mocked me as I wailed. Thank you, Howard. That's what sin does, isn't it? But the Lord calls us to himself to drink from the fountain of the water of life freely. Moses helps them. He saves them by giving them access to the water, by driving back the enemy and opening up the well. The saviors, plural, in the gospel age do what? They give access to the water of life. They introduce thirsty souls to the water of life. Now, who are the thirsty souls? Take your pick. Just look around you. There are thirsty souls wherever you look. Whether they recognize it of themselves or not is not the, the issue. Everyone is a thirsty soul. Those that are seemingly most satisfied with whatever it is that they indulge in. Those who will tell you boldly that what they go in for is very satisfying are thirsty. Jesus recognized that. He knew that. That's why he stood up on that day of the feast and said, let him that is a thirst come unto me and drink. Because all of these people who were pretending to be very satisfied with their religious experience, satisfied with what all of society was engaged in, groupthink, right? everybody going after something and saying it's it's great, it satisfies us, it gives us joy, there's nothing like it. You want to try it, everybody else should get involved. Yet secretly, they weren't satisfied. And therefore tonight, it stands to reason that there would even be some in a meeting like this who are not really satisfied, not truly satisfied, because there is something that is still missing. There's something that you don't have because you're not going to the right source. You're trying to find that satisfaction where you can't find it. There's an emptiness. And it's only Christ. It's only the water of life that can satisfy. The saviors need to drive away the enemy, open up those wells, and give access to the water to bring people to the Lord Jesus Christ. As someone once said, speaking in, in terms of that 
The Lord Jesus Christ has wrought salvation and salvation is available and free to all. They said that the saviors need to get out there and turn the kingdom of darkness into light. In other words, saviors are God's people. God's people in that sense are saviors. To go to a lost world and to tell them of Christ the mighty to save. God says that he will raise up saviors in Mount Zion. There are saviors tonight in the church. Yes, Jesus Christ is the saviour of the church, but he raises up saviours within the church whose job it is under God to bring Christ's salvation to the needy. Whose job it is under God to turn the wayward back unto the Lord Jesus Christ or to turn sinners to Christ. In that sense tonight, to some extent, if you're saved in the meeting, you are to be a saviour. You're not to be your own saviour because you can't do that. But you are to be a saviour in the sense that you will mediate the work of Christ, that you will take his work and you will tell others about it. You will take his gospel and you will bring it to those that are in need. You will bring people to the water of life. And think of what you read in the uh, little epistle of Jude where he talks about saving others, just as a, a further reference to that. And then we move on. Uh, Jude in the verse 23, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Others save, right? pulling them out of the fire. That's the job of the people of God. Why are they sent? Why are these saviors sent? We've had an indication of that already there in Nehemiah 9. It's to do with the manifold mercies of God. We, we read from Deuteronomy 7, and we understand that God sends saviors to, to turn his people back to himself, not because God's people are worthy and deserving, but only because of the mercy and the love of God. And so in Deuteronomy 7, God's people are reminded of why it is that, that they are going to inherit the promised land. Thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto him, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because ye were more in number than any people. For ye were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Why did God redeem them? Why did God help them? Why did God save them? Because of his mercy and because of his love. They weren't any better than anybody else. They weren't stronger. They weren't greater. They weren't mightier. They weren't more noble, they weren't more refined, they weren't more cultured, they weren't more religious. They weren't anything better than anybody else. If anything, they were less than. And yet it, were, it was to these people that God sent salvation. And it was this people that God chose to be his own. As Romans 9, 16 reminds us, it is not of those who will or run, but of God who gives mercy. It's God who gives mercy. God who shows us mercy. Sometimes we are tempted to despair perhaps of that mercy. And, and we think wrongly uh, that God will not be merciful to us anymore. And the psalmist David uh, encountered that, that feeling and he encountered that in his own experience. And, and he, he puts the question then to himself several times across two Psalms, Psalms 42 and 43. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God. He goes on to say, O my God, my soul is cast down within me. And he again poses the question at the end of the same psalm. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? 
Why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God. And he'll go on to ask the same thing twice in Psalm 43. He is cast down. But what do you do when you're cast down? Do you consider the value of your own soul? Do you hope in yourself? Do you hope in what you've done in the past when things were better? Do you hope in some attempt at, at being righteous? Do you hope in a profession? Do you hope in a commitment? Do you hope in anything of yourself? Well, no. David says, hope thou in God. Hope in God. Now, it's not that wistful, sort of vain, empty, vacant type of hope. Not the hope that, you know, people will say, oh, well, I, I, I hope, I hope to get there. I, I hope to be in heaven. There's no basis for their hope. There's no substance to their hope. It's will-o'-the-wisp stuff. It's like trying to catch the clouds in your hands. It doesn't work. But when David says, hope thou in God, he means put your confidence in God. Trust in God. Rely upon God. Because God is reliable. Because God does understand the concept of manifold mercies. Because God hasn't looked upon David or anybody else of his people because they were anything. God set his love upon a people who were nothing. So God's not going to keep loving a people only if they become something by their own efforts, only if they make themselves great, only if they are able to do and to perform and to run. No, no, God says it's not of those who will or run, but of God who gives mercy. Right? You don't make yourself more desirable in God's sight because of something you do, nor can you make yourself less desirable by what you feel to do. Hope in God. Why? Because God is merciful. Because God sends the saviors. The saviors don't appoint themselves. The saviors don't elect themselves. The saviors don't come based on their own whim. God sends them. God establishes the saviors in Zion. And you will, you will notice then something more about them here quickly. How they are sent. Because these saviors are sent ultimately in weakness. They are sent as, as men with words. I've mentioned people like Ezra, Nehemiah, Haggai, Zechariah. What did they come with? They came ultimately with words. And in a sense, there's nothing weaker than words. But yet, it's also true that there's nothing stronger than words, if they be the words of God. And all the way through... The New Testament, we see exactly the same thing. We see these saviors sent. And they come with words. They come with the word of the gospel, with the word of life. And there's an interesting example of this in the life of Peter and Cornelius. Remember, Cornelius was that Roman centurion who was seeking after God. And he was a, a religious man. He was exploring, we might say, Judaism. And he's directed to send for Peter. Who was it that directed Cornelius to send for Peter? Well, an angel appeared on them, remember? An angel appeared from God to, to inform Cornelius that his prayers and his alms had been heard before God. And he was to send for Peter, and Peter would come and speak to him the gospel. Now, isn't it interesting that you've got two messengers in that story of Cornelius? You've got Peter, and you've got an angel. Both bring a message, but only one of them brings the message of the gospel. It's not the angel. It's not the mighty angel in his unfallen, pristine, holy state who is fearful to look upon. It's not the angel that's been given this duty of preaching the gospel. It's Peter. It's, it's Peter, this weak man whose past is marked with failure and mistakes and denial. It's Peter the failure. 
It's Peter, this weak man who has been taken by God and filled with the Spirit of God, who is entrusted to declare unto Cornelius and his household the wonderful message of the gospel. There's inherent weakness in the Savior that is sent with the gospel. Why is that? Same reason why Paul says that he didn't use enticing words of man's wisdom. The same reason why he talks about his own speech being rude and contemptible. So that the confidence of the people wouldn't rest in man. So that it would be evident that the power had nothing to do with man's influence or anything of the Savior's like Peter and Paul. But it would have everything to do with the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ that their confidence would be in Christ himself. And so the instrument is weak. The instrument is just a weak earthen vessel. The instrument has feet of clay. The saviors that are sent are just mere men. They don't have any inherent quality or ability or strength of themselves. And, and if, if there is anything that is accomplished through their preaching and teaching and exhortation... That is due to God alone, working in them and working through them. And that way God sends his saviors upon Mount Zion. And, and it might be tonight that, you see, there's a reluctance to listen to the saviors that are sent. There's a reluctance to pay them any heed. And that reluctance can stem from the fact that they are but earthen vessels. But listen, it's not the saviors that will save you, but rather it's the word that they bring that saves. It's the truth that is communicated that we are to listen to and to receive and to believe so that the, the power that will be at work will be seen clearly to be of God. And, and it is uh, something in terms of these saviors who are sent and how they are sent in weakness. It's not something that is miraculous in its appearance. There's nothing, there's nothing spectacular about it. There's no razzmatazz. There's nothing dazzling. And we're like Naaman, aren't we, sometimes? We want help to some extent. There's, there's part of us that wants helping. But we want help, provided there is something about it that will entertain us, that will flatter us, that will tickle our fancy. We want help so long as we feel that we are getting something special for me. There's an element of pride in the seeking. There's not true seeking of help where we come and prostrate ourselves as humble, undeserving sinners and we'll take anything that God gives. And you see, Naaman comes down and he wants healing from, from his leprosy, but he wants it in a way that suits him. He wants the prophet of God to come out of his house to gesticulate in some way, wave his arms about, clap his hands, pronounce some great wonderful oration, call down some spectacular happening out of heaven that will cause this man to be uplifted and, and the end result be that he would be purged from his leprosy. What he doesn't want and what he doesn't appreciate has been told to go and wash seven times in the River Jordan. That offends him. It's not good enough. It's not spectacular enough. It's not miraculous enough for him. It's weak and it's, it's degrading and it's humbling. And I'll, not settle, and I'll not settle for that, he says. Is that the case tonight that you're waiting for something that's spectacular? See, God has sent a savior tonight in terms of the preaching of this message. And, and many other messages that you've heard, the Savior and Saviors have stood in this pulpit to communicate to you the Word of God. Saviors have come alongside you in your life to speak a word to you personally, to point you to Christ, to point you to the Word of God, to point you to His truth. And what you've actually done is reject them. You've rejected the message that they've brought because it, it wasn't what you wanted. It's not what you're holding out for. You're holding out for something else. You're holding out for something spectacular. You're holding out for some event, some show, some experience, some once for all happening where something dr dramatic is going to happen. But not just somebody who comes with words. 
Isn't it interesting too that in, the, in that case of the rich man and Lazarus that the Saviour speaks about in Luke 16, the rich man, he still believed that if God would only raise up somebody who had died, if God would send somebody back from the other side of the grave, then people would listen. Isn't that curious? There's a man who has died and gone to hell. He knows the reality now of God and of sin and the punishment for sin and so on. Do you see that even in hell, people don't understand anything more of God and the truth in hell than they did in life? People don't become enlightened in hell. Hell's a place of darkness. And it still, it still describes their spiritual condition. They're still in the dark. He honestly thinks that if Lazarus is sent back, his brothers will believe. He still doesn't believe that the Bible is enough. And the message that comes back to the rich man is they've got Moses and the prophets. And if your brothers, if your brothers won't listen to what's written in the Bible, they won't listen to Lazarus. They won't listen to somebody that rises out of the dead, out of the grave to tell them. The reason they won't believe is not because it's not spectacular enough. It's because of the hardness and the blindness of their own hearts. That's why they won't believe. But the Bible is sufficient. The Word of God is sufficient to convince them and to show them the way of truth, the way of life. So it is tonight. You don't need anything more. But you do need to hear the Word of God. And, and we finish by noting what, what we're told here. We're told not only that they'll come to Mount Zion, but they'll also come to judge the Mount of Esau. As I said before, how, how do you do that if Esau has been consumed? Well, in the, in the gospel sense that we're looking at here, the preaching of the gospel cuts two ways, doesn't it? Paul tells us this very clearly in, in his letter to the Corinthian church. But the preaching of the gospel to some people, that's the savour of life unto life. And what he means is that some people hear the gospel and they are enlightened. The Holy Spirit reveals Christ to them. They believe. They, they taste Christ in the gospel. It's sweet to their taste. They put their trust in Christ. And they are, they are thrilled in that. They understand now the reality of their sin, what Jesus Christ has done, how he saves them, how he redeems them. And, and they know that he is the Savior, and they trust him to be their Savior. They put their confidence in him, and they, they lay themselves upon Christ. And their hope of heaven, their hope of ever being saved, is, is firmly placed in Christ. Rests, everything rests in him. And even though there's a temptation to, at times, turn away and go elsewhere, they, they feel constrained, really, like Peter and the other apostles, to say, Lord, to whom shall we go? Where else do I go? This is difficult. At times it's confusing. We feel that we feel and we do. There, there, are, there are things that don't seem to go right, and, and there are pressures and there are tensions and all the rest of it. But we, we come to this point where, when we are pressed and squeezed by circumstance and by sin and by the attacks of the wicked one, when, when all this comes to bear upon us uh, and the, the threat and the intent of the enemy is to, to sort of squeeze any kind of life out of us and any confidence in Christ out of us, we come to this place and say, but I, I can't. I can't go anywhere else. I can't go to anybody else because it's only Jesus Christ that has the words of eternal life. I, just, I simply cannot go anywhere else. There's no other option. There's no option about just going back to, to how things were before. That doesn't work. There's no point in going back to a previous set of ideas about how to live life and, and how to face eternity. None of that works. The reality is Jesus Christ is the Savior. I don't have anywhere else to go. But for other people, the gospel is the savour of death unto death. The gospel doesn't make them live. The gospel doesn't make them sing. The gospel doesn't enlighten their minds. The gospel doesn't make them sit up and think of Christ and, and see in him significance and meaning. They don't see what Christ has done. He's nothing. 
He's just a figure in history. He's just a religious man. He's just the person that you hear about in church. He's the person of the Easter story. He's the person of the Christmas story. Uh, he, he's all of that. But in terms of any meaning for them personally, and in terms of him actually accomplishing something for them, no, he's nothing. And they dismiss that, really. They don't dismiss it in the sense that they uh, stand up and say, I dismiss all of this and I reject all of this, but it means nothing to them. It's water off a duck's back. It's neither here nor there. It's, I, I, you know, I can take it, I can leave it. It really doesn't make any difference to me. And this same message then divides people, doesn't it? And that's part of the judgment here that is spoken of. These saviors will judge Mount Esau. They will preach the gospel. They will tell people of Jesus Christ. They will lead people to the fountain of living water and people won't drink. They'll look at that water, as it were, and say it's bitter, the sweetest water. And it will be rejected as being bitter. It will be dismissed as being unnecessary. It will be looked at as irrelevant. And yet it's the water of life. And that will be the judgment on Mount Esau. And it's the kind of judgment that, and this is why Genesis was in my mind earlier on, it's the kind of judgment that you see in the, the life of Lot. In Genesis chapter 19. In Genesis 19, you remember how the the angels came into the city and how he brought them into his house and the men of the city uh, in great anger wanting to pursue their sin they came in, uh, to Lot's door to his house and they said this stand back and they said again this one fellow came in to sojourn and he will needs be a judge. So they're banging at the door, trying to break his door down to get in, to get at these men. And Lot says, no, he holds the door shut against them. And their word is, this one fellow came in to sojourn, among, uh, to sojourn and he will needs be a judge. Now this was Lot who, although he was vexed with their filthy conversation day after day, he dwelt in the midst of Sodom. He had to tolerate a certain amount. He had to keep his mouth shut more often than not. He didn't say a great deal. He didn't go about exposing and condemning their sin because he lived there relatively peacefully for a considerable period of time. And he maybe thought he was doing a good thing. And some people would commend him and say, well done, Lot. Uh, you didn't offend anybody in the city. Congratulations. Well, notice what happens on the one occasion, just once now, when he actually stands up and opposes the people of that city, when he dares to say no to them. What's been in their mind all the time? They hate him. And they accuse him of judging them. He's judging us. He's telling us that we are not right. He's saying that what we're trying to do is sinful and wrong. Here he is, and he thinks he's a judge of us. Well, yes, he was. Yes, he was. Because he was showing by his actions that what they were trying to do was sinful and wrong and abhorrent in the sight of God. And that's what saviors are to do. But they're not going to be warmly applauded by the world. Thank you so much for showing us our inconsistencies. Thank you so much for telling us that we have sinned. Thank you for standing for truth and righteousness and opposing our desires to go on sinning. Thank you for being an obstacle and a hindrance in our path of sin. No, the world hates that. But that's the call of the servant. The judge or the savior brings in the gospel. And the gospel is preached 
And the gospel is preached in the way that the Savior instructed his disciples to communicate the gospel. You remember what the Lord Jesus said in, in Mark 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth shall be saved. And to those who hear that message, those who bring the message are saviors. That's the message tonight. If you believe, you'll be saved. If you trust Christ, you trust what he has done. As we sang tonight, he said it is finished. It's not me saying that as Christ's words. It is finished. He's done the work. You, you can trust him. You can trust the work that he has done. You can trust that what he did is, is enough. And that that will get you to heaven. Put your trust in him. Turn from your sin, turn to him. And cast your soul upon him. And if you hear that message and you believe him, then this is the voice of the Savior. But Jesus also said, He that believeth not shall be damned. And to those that don't believe, this is the voice of a judge. Because it is the voice that says, if you will not believe, if you will die not believing, you will be damned. And you'll be judged by God. God stated very clearly that saviors shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau. Those that God sends with his word to point sinners back to him. We've tried tonight with God's help to point you to Christ to show you that that's what a saviour does is to point you to the saviour but these small s saviours the saviours in the plural they work to point you to the one saviour the Lord Jesus Christ but there's judgement tonight there's a line there's a dividing line going through the meeting tonight on one side, those that believe and are saved. On the other side, those that do not believe and are not believing. And there's judgment. There's judgment that hangs over your head, ready. It's ready to break out upon your head at any moment in time. And that's the reality tonight. But the message is to turn. To turn from your sin. Don't, don't throw God's word behind your back and say it doesn't matter and you don't care. Turn around. Repent. Turn back to God. Confess your sin. Put that sin away and turn to the Savior. Get right with him. Get right with God. Lest you would be found outside of Christ and damned. And so may the Lord have mercy on our souls tonight. May he save those that are lost. If you're saved tonight, the world needs small s saviors. Right? The world needs people to go and tell of Jesus Christ. The world needs people who will stand up, drive away the false shepherds, drive away those that would keep people away from the water of life and open up the wells of salvation. Bring people to the water of life. Bring them to Christ. Bring Christ to them. Bring them the water of life. That thirsty souls would be satisfied and quenched. It can't be any other way. The world needs saviors to get out into this world so that the darkness would be dispelled and light would come flooding in to this dark world. May God make you such. May he spur us on and fill us with his spirit to make us effectual witnesses for Christ. May God bless his word tonight to all of our hearts for his name's sake. Amen. Let's sing in closing, please. And, uh